This week's episode is brought to you by Closed for Business. Let me ask you, how long has it been since you upgraded the doors in your tower? A thousand years? Ten thousand? A hundred thousand years? If you're like most people, you aren't really sure how long it's been since you've replaced your tower doors. And you've probably asked your friends, and they all have a different opinion of how long it's been, and they all probably have a different reason for why. Well, no matter how long it's been, it's time to change them. Say you've sent a distracted apprentice to procure some reading material for a client. Did you know that the standard cover size for most works have greatly increased since the glaciers receded? How will your troublesome apprentice get those books through your old-fashioned slot? At Close for Business, they have door slot options to suit the most oversized modern volume. And if you call now, they'll include a handy peephole so your journeyman won't have to bend over and peek through your undersized slot. Just go to their website and use promo code RE-READ, no spaces. And thank you, Close for Business, for sponsoring the Rereading Wolf podcast. Warning. The following discussion is deliberately riddled with spoilers and unhinged speculation on this nearly 40-year-old book, Gene Wolfe's The Book of the New Sun. You can't read a Gene Wolfe story. You can only reread a Gene Wolfe story. Welcome to Rereading Wolf. We'll abandon the literary artifice that this is the first time you and we have read these books. We're going to try to understand, and that means considering the books as a whole. Hi, I'm James Wynn. And I'm Craig Brewer. So we got some new comments on our chapter six discussion, and we also have still have some cleanup from our bonus episode time. You know, Craig, there's no great love for my theory that Alton the Exultant is a Vodolani and that he <laughs> fed off that corpse that they dug up in the Acropolis. That surprises me, not one bit. <laughs> yet. I persevere. Nevertheless. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's it's a reach. And I mean, we both talked about how we had n- sort of negative views of Alton's for different reasons. But yeah, I mean, I it sort of comes back to one of those points, I think, of whether you're taking moments in the text as metaphorical or as plot. Like, is it literal or metaphorical what they're talking about or what's being suggested? And that's that's perfectly, hey, part of the fun is that there are times when it could be both. And I was just talking to a friend about the mountains in sort of the Lictor. And one of the very first times he describes the mountains, he talks about the sun, the sun coming over the crowns of the mountains. And I told him, I'm like, is that a metaphor or is that literal? And he's like, what do you mean? I was like, keep reading that part. And it talks about how it's, you know, like it's the, the faces of the rulers of earth. And he's like, Oh, I was like, could be literal crowns. The, the tops of the mountains that he's talking about. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, So yeah, that, but that's a totally fair thing to do. To go back. Well, Alton has a significant amount of love (laughs) in this world. And I think that it is going to be a hard swallow to say that he's in league with Vodalus. Yeah. But I believe, I really believe he is. I mean, I'm not just making this stuff up. I really think that that is implied. But other people have other opinions about that. Uh, Mark Aramini said, let me quote, I think rather that Alton and Vodalus represent two different means of excavating the past. The library books no one reads anymore is a fragment that attempts to recreate all of humanity, though its authors speak no more with mortal tongues. The objects themselves become all that is left of their wisdom, a fragment that might or might not contain all of the person who has turned to dust. Is this where humanity can be found or in art? or in the cells of the human brain that Vodalus wants to pillage? Blind, Olten, impotent Vodalus, what can lead humanity to glory again? Neither, but both suggest that something survives after death, a numinous continuation. By earth of the new sun, it will be clear that the horrors of the body are cast aside, but the spirit remains, even if it is transformed in the process. 
I see Olten and Vodalus as different personifications of an attempt to hold on to the past that must be ultimately redeemed by something else. Yeah, so Mark's taking more of the metaphorical approach there with right. everything. And I'll admit that's where I really come down on it too. I mean, even my negative take on Olten was more of that sort of metaphorical take. Um, and that all the, you know, when he's when he's looking or thinking about the glories that he might get from the eating the historian or whatever, that those are more sort of wistfulness. Uh, but you found different right. different points there uh, or different connections. Well, and Nigel Price went off on Michael's connection between Great Expectations and the Book of the New Sun with another Dickens parallel. When Severian later joins Dr. Tallis's theater troupe, he sees a parallel to both Great Expectations and Dickens novel Nicholas Nickleby, where the protagonist meets a theatrical manager, Vincent Crummels, at an inn and then asks on stage with some success, just as Severian does. His point is that, quote, Wolf consciously uses the Dickensian fictional autobiography as a literary model for the Book of the New Sun. And we should therefore not be surprised if episodes in his work in some way echo incidents and themes in Dickens. He thinks it might be interesting to compare the descriptions of schools in Dickens' novels to Severian's education. He particularly references Nicholas Nickleby and David Copperfield. Yeah, and I, I told him there too. I was like, that means I have to read Nicholas Nickleby. That's one I've, I've never read. <laughs> yeah, I know. Read, um, I've read tons of other stuff. But um, that point, I think, seems spot on, and especially for Shadow. There, there are times mm-hmm. afterwards where I feel like the, so much of Shadow, even when we get later on, has that sort of Dickensian feeling where you're getting these over the top characters and, you know, a world where the city life is, you know, complicated and everybody's got an angle and, you know, there are scams going on and old tragedies and old grudges and all kinds of stuff. And it totally feels like that. And I think that's absolutely a good sort of intuition to have. Once we get later on with Claw or Sword, it seems a little bit of a different feel, but shadow in particular, I feel like if you're looking for, yeah, that, that one literary model, people have mentioned stuff about Proust or they've mentioned things. Um, I mean, we talked about Borges before, but I, I, the more I read it this time, the more what Nigel says seems right. That Dickens is probably the, the atmospheric father. <laughs> of, yeah, I can yeah. see that. It's uh it's great expectations of earth. So Mike Benowitz was definitely on team Craig for chapter six. <laughs> He identified with your depiction of Alton as directionless and made, I thought, an interesting connection between Severian's journey through a labyrinth to meet Valeria with the one he takes in his meeting with Alton. He says, quote, the first one ends with his sense of stagnation of Earth via discussion with Valeria. The second one, he gains a sense of the staggering accumulation of human knowledge and history all while Alton explains the inutility of all this information. The books are basically husks. They have become just useless things now. Yeah, which is so sad. <laughs> I mean, it was my idea, but I still don't. It's still so sad. It's still, or not my idea, but my reaction to, to things. Like right. And also, your description of the library really set him off, where you say it is quote, a huge accumulation of things not being put to any particular good use. Mike says, quote, later, when Severian has to flood Earth, destroying this archive of human history, he has a deep understanding that this horde of history isn't doing anyone much good anyway. That is deep setup. I never really noticed how clear it is until Craig pointed at Alton's aimlessness. Yeah, I think a lot of us will say, yeah, the Earth, especially in the early parts of New Sun or early parts of Shadow, Nessus and the Commonwealth are this sort of degraded, trashed out city. But I think sometimes we don't take that super seriously because then we worry later on about like, oh, but what is the flood going to destroy? And I think there's a way to read a lot of what goes on, especially early in Shadow, to be like, you know, what here is worth saving? What do they even remember? I mean, even sort of the stories in the Brown book, they're a way to hold on to some of the gems from the past, but they're so misunderstood now and they're so messed up. You know, all of these different ways of looking at it, it's sort of, I think if you take that really empty feeling that I kind of described with Olten and you find that in other places, it almost makes the flood feel less tragic. 
<laughs> less awful. I mean, yes, it is very sad that so much has to be destroyed and, you know, and so many people have to die. But at the same time, I think that what mm. Wolf is doing is setting up a world where, where you need some kind of washing away and wiping away of what's old. And you need a savior. Yeah. It, well, well, you need a, not just a savior, but you also need a, a, you, you literally need a flood. You need something that truly will wash away all this old stuff so that you can start new, that, that it may be that it's holding people back and it's, it's weighing us down. It's the Marie Kondo solution to Earth's problem. Oh yes. It doesn't spark joy. Yeah. Alton's library no longer sparks joy. So <laughs> we will thank it and we will put it away. Yeah. I don't like, I don't like that, but I feel like that's kind of what Wolf's developing here. That's, that's one, right. one thing he's putting forward. That's the setup and he does it very well. He mm -hmm. sets the stakes to, uh, in a way that the reader can come along. Mm -hmm. In fact, Mike pretty much echoes exactly what you said. He says later, some readers see the fact that Severian destroys the earth as evidence of him being evil, but all that death is necessary for the resurrection he brings. I think we are to get the sense from Alton that the value of Earth's history is about as valuable as a misguided old ghost who can't read. <laughs> the Alton Appreciation Society is going to be coming for our heads soon. Well, regarding my uh, curiositus Earthus that Alton is a Vodolani, Mike proposed another meaning. He says, quote, uh, maybe the vision of Alton as a ghost is an example of Severian's future knowledge leaking forward in time. Alton and his library are dead history. Well, all I care about is that Mike liked my pick for the outro music. Because <laughs> that's that's really the only reason I do this thing in the first place. And they are good picks. Let's admit. Let's, <laughs> let's all admit they are very fun. <laughs> so you have to stay and listen for the end. That's right. That's right. On Reddit, on the Gene Wolf subreddit, uh, our discussion of the number 17 in Wolf's work prompted the Redditor named Severian of Nessus to consider all the possible elusive references from which Wolf might have been drawing from regarding his use of that number in the Book of the New Sun. I thought his list was pretty expansive. The East India Trading Company, Plutarch, the Bible. It's worth going to look at, by the way. I mean, we, we can't go over every part of it, but it's Honestly, if you're, it's sort of funny to say, but it's a well constructed research post. <laughs> so it's yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a mini essay, and it's it's worth. There's a lot of good information. There. Uh, he, I, I'll assume it's a he, drilled down deepest on the connection to the Book of Revelation, and I found that connection intriguing because the Book of Re Revelation is eschatology end times, and the Book of New Sun is also an eschatological eschatological work. And also, I myself, some time ago, wrote two separate essays on the connection between Revelation, including the very same passage this Redditor referenced, and the Book of the Long Sun, also a separate eschatological story. And in addition, I wrote a separate essay on the allusions to Revelation in the Fifth Head of Cerberus. I'll add a link to this Reddit in the show notes. Also... On Facebook, Brian Lovely provoked an interesting technical discussion about the physical effect of the coming new sun and its effect on Severian's ability to travel through time. It'll probably be relevant to our discussion in about eight years. But. <laughs> I hadn't said anything about it because I was totally, yeah, I'm like, oh, I, my, my memory of how the, the, the magic slash technology slash quasar slash white fountain slash everything that's going on there is, is still fuzzy. So, right. Uh, Mallory Adams wrote us on email after listening to chapter three episode, the autarks face. And let me stop and say how happy I am that people continue to pitch ideas about these episodes long after the show has quote moved on. Supposedly. Oh yes. I mean, technically because of our recording process, even, you know, the last episode published is ancient history for you and me, mm -hmm. but really there's always a little more to say about them. Oh, yeah. And there's always a chance that someone is going to detect an error or major omission in our conversation. I have more to say about chapter six that I didn't even include because I didn't think of them in time and we've decided they'll make more sense later. So, you know, thank you, Mallory. Anyway, Mallory says, quote, 
In reviewing the importance of the naming convention of the Manichin Tower as an object of both conquest and submission, it may also be helpful to consider La Maniche and Our Lady of Guadalupe. These figures of the Manichin performance not only reflect Severian's perception of womanhood as its domineering mistress and sacred mother, but also point to the duality of the figure of El Hijo de la Lamencha, that is the children of La Maniche. A, um, I'm garbling that pronunciation, by the way. I'm aware. A, she goes on, a pejorative term also embraced by some to connote the spiritual, cultural, and genetic mixing of indigenous and Castilian bloodlines to create the Mexican identity. Does this duality spring to life in multiple aspects of Severian to include his parentage, his role in both history and reality, and even his narrative voice? Now, I think this is an important observation about Severian. I mean, his name denotes a divided persona, a divided potential future, maybe even a divided past. On this reading, I'm trying hard to understand what about that division Wolf specifically injected into Severian's story. I had not considered the divided modern perspective of, of La Malinche, who herself helped enable a kind of civilization ending flood in Central America. So, you know, thanks for that. I just like this because I don't think a lot of us necessarily intuitively take a sort of Latin American context to this, even though we know it's set in South America. And I think there's probably an unspoken assumption that even Wolf didn't really have that much, you know, and I'm not, I'm not, whether that's good or wrong, I, or, or whether that's right or wrong, I don't know, but I just know that in the comments, there's not a whole lot of discussion of that context. So I feel like even our kind of hesitation about like, well, why did he choose the Madichin dance? You know, it, right. like we, it, we were sort of a little bit at a loss just because we didn't, we had to go searching for more of the cultural context for that. Right. It makes me want to reevaluate that and think, well, maybe Wolf knew a little bit more about what he was doing with, with that South American or, or Central American context with those choices, because it might have a lot more to add to Severian. We certainly know there's the Borges there. We've got the Madachin. We've got little things here and there about like, you know, the matcha that they drink or, or things mm -hmm. like that. We've got the stone town, which might be potentially something with uh, the Incans. Yeah, it's but I feel like there's a whole other set of possibilities that we're not really looking at there that could feed a lot into what the Commonwealth is and why Wolf chose to put it down there and what other things. I mean, it's easy to say, oh, it's so it happened so far after that, that we don't have to really worry about actual Latin American history. But I'm not so sure that that's the case because he still did put it in South America, you know, for a reason. And so. I think I really like that approach. I, I wish I knew more to say, but I really appreciate it for that reason. Well, the Manichinas are still so intriguing to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that Manichin dance, the, the conquest dance. Wolf often embeds signals to readers through awkward silences. Mm -hmm. That he made so much of the Manichin dance, naming Severian's home after it and referring to it indirectly, but never describing it or naming it in the story. Yeah. This implies to me that it must have a very revealing meaning to the plot of this story. I I'm struggling to understand what this ritual that seems to predate Christianity to me meant to Wolf himself. Yeah, I know. And, and that's where it's hard to know. It's like where I really wish we knew what his library was. <laughs> yeah. Like there are a few, there are a few authors who we, we can actually go back and find out the actual contents of their library just to know what, books they had easy you know it's easy access doesn't mean that that's necessarily all they read or anything like that but at least if you can know that you know okay in the 1700s books were harder to get and so if he had easy access to these then this was the context he had for this that you know it would be so like i i always say i really wish i had whatever book or set of books that wolf had for the saints because it would <laughs> make all those saints names so much easier um, but the same with this like where's there a certain set of histories that he was looking at um, or, or I guarantee that a publisher could make some amount of money just publishing a list of books sitting in Gene Wolfe's house, mm -hmm. you know, at, at some point. 
before, <laughs> you know, before he moved to Peoria and probably had to get rid of books. But but no, I really for for all for just really pointing out that aspect that I think we probably to our detriment don't focus on enough of uh, the mm-hmm. Latin American context that Wolf could be putting in play here. Yeah, I just appreciated that. <laughs> Definitely. By the way, I should go back and say I said Latin American and I don't. I guess we're you actually talking again? about Latin, <laughs> right? Yeah. We're not, these are not in the U.S. Depend, I guess it depends on how you take Latin American. If you no. mean Latin American in the sense of North and South America, uh, but I suppose Latin American can also technically mean someone in the U.S. So right. my terminology is all off. So, <laughs> so Jason Vogel, I think I'm pronouncing that right, Jason, will listen to chapter four and was interested in the Robert Borsky theory that Valeria was Severian's grandmother. With due respect to Borsky, I think neither of us have bought into his theory regarding Valeria and Not on that Severian's one. grandmother. Yeah. I have my own suspicions about Valeria, so my reasoning, you know, it might be highly motivated. But I think we both agree that there just isn't much evidence either way to declare that she's Sev's grandmother. I, I said that Borsky was simply falling into a desire for symmetry. Severian has a paternal grandmother. He should have a maternal one as well. Yeah. And I think if I'm recalling correctly, that's how he actually makes the suggestion that it's not really a textual, Mm -hmm. it's not something he found or something. It's more that kind of, yeah, it's, it's more of a, yeah, exactly. An argument from symmetry. And in fact, his whole family tree then should be mapped out. And as much as I love this sort of thing, I'm not willing to dance on a limb with it. However, you know, in our interview with Michael Andre Drisi, he very credibly associated Valeria with Miss Havisham from Great Expectations, as well as with her ward, Estella. So, you know, anything's possible Mm -hmm. in a wolf labyrinth. Mm -hmm. Robin Smith in this discussion doubled down on something that we talked about in that chapter, that as with the last house, Severian seems to only be able to access it one way and can't go back. He pointed out that Abel has the same situation in Wolf's novel, The Wizard Knight. And I'll point out that it was the same in the novel, There Are Doors. The protagonist, Green, can walk through a door between dimensional worlds, but if he turns around, he can't return that way. It won't be a a door anymore. To return, he has to walk backwards without turning around, which opens up another possible theory for how Severian could have returned, right? By One. walking backwards in his own footprints. But, you know, he doesn't mention doing that when he returns to the tunnels either. So just a tiny point, just to point out other similarities. That's kind of what Agia tells him about the path in the jungle, in the jungle garden too. That instead of, he, he looks behind him and he's like, I can't, the door disappeared. And she's like, well, right. just go forward and follow it. That, that, that pattern shows up in many places. Jason also pointed out that the atrium of time is a time traveling device Not everyone is in accordance with that. Charles Gillingham supposes that it is outside of time. I'm not 100% sure what he would argue about this, but I think I might agree somewhat. It seems to me that Valeria's quarters are somewhat stuck eternally in some date in the past. Again, Manus's connection to the atrium of time and Manor House in Great Expectations confirms that for me. And... As per usual, I'm going to withhold judgment on that. <laughs> still not entirely convinced that Valeria is in another time, but yeah, but we'll, th- th- yeah, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> and again, on the Facebook page, uh, Mark Aramini has some thoughts about the art in the Pinocathecan in chapter five during his talk with Rudison. The dancer with the leashes he sees as a symbolic representation of the hero Gramate uh, Zadkiel. Mark notes that when Severian looks at the picture, his brow bleeds. Mark has a detailed theory about the origins of the heroes, and he sees this as related to this effect as well. The other picture he describes thus, quote, the three women dressing in flowers allegorizes Dorcas and perhaps the other women who meet her, as Dorcas is herself a symbol of earth. As she was drowned but lives beyond her death, adorning herself with flowers. Well, you know, I don't know. Maybe. I certainly don't have an explanation for those pictures. 
No, the only thing I when he when Mark was talking about that, it made me think it would be odd to me at least. It'd be odd if Wolf had two very big sort of allegorical pictures, and then we get to the literal moon photo. Um, that right. Would, that would just be a sort of weird incongruity um, because it seems to me like if you're going to have those paintings, then what Mark says actually makes a lot of sense to me and makes me want to think. Okay, so what is the what's the moon night <laughs> or the astronaut <laughs> painting? What is that allegorizing? Um, because when he, when Wolf does things like that, there's, I don't find many times where he's like, okay, these two things are all big symbols, <laughs> but then this one thing over here is actually just focus on the plot thing that it's telling you about. Yeah. You know, well, like initially he didn't have question. an answer for that. It was, right. th they didn't fit. But then after some thought, he says, uh, quote, Golden Helm Severian as warrior of a dead world, the image placed among trees, golden sun coming, the old wasteland erased and replaced with blooming jungles. There need not be only the lunar landing implication. That's true. Of yep. this picture. Yep. And I like that a lot. So, but that was yep. just one thing that made me think, you know, before I got to admit, I was thinking mainly of, okay, are these two weird descriptions of paintings I'm supposed to be recognizing mm -hmm. somewhere else? But, right. um, but yeah, when Mark described them that way, it was it it kind of clicked a little more like that. That may be a little bit better, and right. it it kind of stopped stopped that itch that I needed to find exactly <laughs> what, they, uh, <laughs> what what you know was that American Gothic described in some very strange way? I don't know. So um, yeah, <laughs> probably not. But yeah. Well, on the Facebook page again, Pat Moody posted a link to a Washington Post review of a history book by Joel Harrington entitled The Faithful Executioner, Life and Death, Honor and Shame in the Turbulent 16th Century. All right. This is really oh. fascinating, actually, because it's a whole historical account of a, an honest to goodness executioner and what mm -hmm. his life was like and what kind of things he went through, what the other people's reaction was to him, how he practiced his profession. Um, it's it's fascinating. What I found really interesting about this book is how much Wolf got right about the lot of an executioner, a carnifex, if you will, in the near ancient times. That is, he's generally loathed by the public, but also that his knowledge of killing made him a competent surgeon as well. And he mm -hmm. ran a brisk business on the side. And this made me think of Severian's demonstrated skill with Triskeling. Yeah. And just all the other sort of things that he seems to be good at because of what he's done. Yeah, it's it, it totally goes against the idea that the torture is, you know, that brutish image that Gerlos has to show to everyone else. Yeah, it's it was fun that it it confirmed a lot of the things yeah. that Wolf had created there. Yeah. He, uh, Pat Moody also asked everyone, oh, what's your book of gold? I noticed you I noticed you said The Hobbit. Yeah, mine was Tolkien. And that's that's the earliest thing I can remember my dad reading me Hobbit and everything kind of snowballed from there. Well, I didn't respond because the, my short answer struck me as the sort of answer someone gives to impress people that has zero chance of impressing anyone. <laughs> uh, the long answer is that I never had a book of gold, a, a book that suddenly turned me around as a young child and inducted me into the library wherever I was from that day forward. Instead, I, I, I had a, a wall of gold with, with many bricks. That's nice. There was, you know, Charlotte's Web. I was a, as a seven-year-old, I was incredibly obsessed and terrified by the prospect of inevitable death. And I truly appreciate the part when Wilbur discovers that he will certainly die at the end of the season. He goes running around the pen crying, but I don't want to die. And, you know, and then there was The Hobbit, particularly Bilbo's conversation with Smaug, that I still look forward to rereading every time I do. And there was Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea with its intricate hard science world building. But, you know, the real pinnacle was when I discovered, uh, no, rediscovered the Bible. And this is the short answer that I didn't want to mention. I, I'd grown up with this book everywhere, and I was quite convinced I knew it. But as a young teen, I rediscovered it as literature, not as an anthology of various literature, but mm -hmm. as a single story. I finally understood why people reread it yeah. over and over and, and read it closely, just as Wolf readers read his works. 
yeah. people who be- people who believe the New Testament epistles and gospels and the Torah and the prophetic writings and the poetry, they, they read them closely, divining messages from the author in stray phrases, the way people do in modern prose and poetry. And those who wrote the Jewish books of poetry and prophecy read the Torah that way. Those who wrote the gospels and epistles, as well as the pharisaical schools where they grew up, they read them that way too. And so consequently, each book that came carried forward like red silk threads, these literary themes across the whole, building and building so that I began, when reading had taught me to be able to do it, I read the historical books of the Torah as a story where the author has something to say to me, the reader. The Levitical segments in the Pentateuch were were like moments of a side in the Book of the New Sun, like the stories from the Brown Book or the storytelling (laughs) contests that open up the world. And those books of poetry and writings of the prophets were like Severian's moments of reverie, reflecting on the themes of the plot. And the Gospels were the climax, and the epistles were the long denouement, the, like the conversations Severian has at the end of Citadel of the Autark. And Revelation is the twist ending that wraps up the narrative threads and takes it all back to a garden with the tree of life in the center. Neil Gaiman apparently said that the Book of the New Sun taught him how to read. But for me, my rediscovery of the Bible taught me how to read Gene Wolfe when I finally discovered that unlike most fiction, you were supposed to read it just as believing people read the Bible. So reading the Bible taught me to enjoy Wolf's writings the way I do. And you can blame it all on God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it's, I tell students all the time and I have a whole bunch of adult students um, for, for right now. And they uh, will read something that they've had to read before and they'll talk about how much more they get out of it. And they'll, they'll often think it's because I'm older now. Um, and you mentioned doing that when you were a teenager, you know, I don't think it's often because they're just older. I think it's because sometimes you've been forced to read something at one point and it's just a book, but then when you actually come to a book and you've got your own reasons to read it and, and you want something from it, it, it makes that, that sort of ownership much different, you know, I mean, like the kind of thing we're doing here of actually like rereading and putting things together. You can do that with any book. You know, I mean, we, we talk about how rewarding it is to do with Wolf, but you know, that's my day job. <laughs> you know, it's like you know, it's with everything, every book. Um, and yeah. And, and it just sort of takes that, that wanting to get something out of it instead of just the turning the pages to, to get the information and move on, but to actually want to, want to sit there and wait and tarry with a book as they say and and really think about it so yes i get that chapter seven the traitorous so severian returns at last from the library we've spent three episodes with severian wandering around in the labyrinthian library encountering the minotaur (laughs) alton And now he's back. It's time to take meals to the journeymen who will then in turn give them to the prisoners in their cells. Drota is in charge of the first level. But but Severian started with the lower levels first because he wants to give it to Drota last. He wants to talk to him about Alton. He finds him in a client's cell. That's Drota. Drota is leaning over a middle-aged woman and she doesn't look good. There's blood on the floor. He's busy with his work, and he doesn't look at him. The woman has torn off her dressings, trying to bleed herself to death. But Drota got there just in time, saved her life. He's still working on on the bandage, and he asks Severian to take the meals to his clients. Severian hesitates. As an apprentice, he's not technically supposed to have any dealings with the clients. Uh, should we address the fact that he's done that before? <laughs> that- yeah. And I mean, he's set it up with Triskel um, and how he's come up and down and, um, you know, that even though there were these rules that he's able to get around them and, and, you know, people get lazy and you do chores for them. As he said, it's not a prepossessing place. One thing I thought was fun was he just says that when he's worried about that for a second, he has the line, apprentices were not supposed to deal with those committed to the guild's care. I just like the phrase there, the guild's care, <laughs> which is not what you would think a torturer would do. But, well, Drota did save this woman's life. Absolutely. So. Yeah. so Drota thinks he's making a big deal out of nothing. 
when he hesitates. He says, you only have to put the food in the slots. But Severian says, well, I, you know, I brought these books. Well, put those through the slots too. So he does. Some of the clients aren't strong enough to get up and take the food through the slots. I tend to picture the slots as being on the ground level, but clearly they aren't. They're higher up. Mm -hmm. One thing we should mention too, this is, we also, when he's describing the woman that Drada is rebandaging, she's described again as livid, uh, which was the same word that he uses to describe the woman whose grave was being robbed. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's very pale and they were purplish actually. Yeah. I had to, that one I had to look up. <laughs> so to be honest, I was like, what exactly is this, the meaning that he's working? And it's more, it's like a livid bruise. Um, so like a purplish, purplish grayish bruise. So for the clients that, that aren't strong enough to get up and take their food to the slots, he just leaves them outside the door for draw to take in. There were some aristocratic looking women, but he knows they aren't who he got the book for. Chatelaine Thecla. He knows she's an exultant and that she's to be treated with deference because they're getting books for her. And, you know, she just came to the tower. So I suppose these women look uh, abused. Chatelaine is a title for a high level woman. I presume he looks through the slots to see who's there. Oh, one thing, just real quick about the, the term Chatelaine too, just because I think it's, um, I think it's a word that most people, when you first hear it, makes sense as a kind of title. I mean, it has the the feminine sound, but it also, you know, seems like a, a, a designation of respect in one way or another. Um, it is connected to the English word that some people may know, which is castellan, which is like a castler, someone who's in charge of a castle. And it's the, um, the, the French version is um, really the woman who would be the wife of the man in charge of the castle or of the chateau you know, Chatelaine, <laughs> that's where it comes from. But I do like, there is a connection that you might be hearing in there with that connection to Castellan and Chatelaine. I don't know that that's pretty obvious to people, but when I started, heard it, I was like, oh yeah, there's the, there's the closest cognate. I felt like I was hearing through the word at some point. So that's what the word itself means. So, um, can we talk about that name? Thecla. Once again, I think this is, this is one of those names that are not necessarily about the saint at all. St. Thecla is venerated as a saint in the Roman Catholic tradition, as well as Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, and Episcopal, that is, Church of England traditions. She comes to us from an apocryphal work, the Acts of Paul and Thecla. And she was never martyred, but always saved from martyrdom. Her story is essentially a lifelong quest to stay a virgin in a world that finds that unacceptable. She She's inspired by hearing the teachings of the Apostle Paul. Now, I don't want to hear from theologians that staying a virgin is a central tenet of Christian life is something Paul's writings denigrate. This is the story. Her mother and fiancé try to have her burned at the stake, but she's not burned by the fire and a miracle saves her. And then eventually she's sent to the arena to fight wild beasts. But a female lion defends her to the death. And at last, she has no other solution and she baptizes herself by jumping into a <sighs> pool of killer seals. <laughs> She's miraculously saved again. So things go on like this. Her virginity is imperiled by evil men until she dies in her 90s. Now, Tertullian, that is St. Tertullian, who lived in the late second century, aided the story of Thecla because people were using it to argue that women should be authorized to baptize converts because, you know, Thecla had baptized herself. He claimed it was known fact that the original compiler of the story was some preacher who elaborated on it and for that reason was defrocked. But no one ever listens to Tertullian. <laughs> and a century later, she's a prominent martyr in the Mediterranean. There are tombs of Thecla in Rome and Cyprus, Syria, and Turkey, her story is oozing with girl power moments. But why our Thecla was given her name is beyond me. Maybe it's simply the injustice of her situation, an injustice that in the Commonwealth could only happen to women. Could be that. And the fact that, like you said, she was never quite martyred. I mean, we know that Thecla isn't quite dead all the way. Well, she baptizes mm -hmm. herself, so mm -hmm. to speak. So they're definitely, those, those certainly seem like good 
possible reasons it would work. And yet with a character as important as Thecla, it seems like looking to the name and, and the you know possible connections to the same name is definitely worthwhile. However, recently, I was discussing this with Michael Andre Gerisi, and he listed some plausible associations to the name. But then quite casually, he added, and then there's the fact that the name is a near homonym to the claw, Thecla, the claw. Whoa. Yeah, see, I had never noticed that before. But you said that Michael actually thought that was common knowledge. I said, wait a minute. Is that well-known lore? How could this be the first time I've heard of this? He said he assumed it was brought up on the Earth list, but a search didn't find it. So he guesses it came up on the previous genie list serve. <laughs> Look, I'm going to say right now that I think this is likely the reason for her name, Thecla. The claw is the physical symbol of the new sun. It is Thecla who knows everything about spirituality and religion, anything higher and more significant than the practical craft of torture and execution. What is it about Severian that Emar and Appian, if that is the name of the Autark Severian calls only the old Autark, what is it about Severian that allows him to attain the prize where others failed? Like Severian, the old Autark had the memories of the entire line of Autarks before, going back ages. There are instances where the old Autark demonstrates feats of memory. I think that Thecla is the secret sauce. She is the ingredient added to Severian that enables him to pass the test where others failed. She is the claw of the conciliator, the anointing spirit. If Severian is a Gnostic Christ, the Arminian Christ, then Thecla is the Holy Spirit ascending upon him during his baptism in the form of a dove. And I don't know what that connection is to Thea, but I suspect this is the reason her voice is continuously associated with a dove. The point is that she is the indwelling spirit that makes Severian the man into Severian the conciliator. And honestly, in terms of just the way the story goes, that's kind of right, because she's the one who sets him on a path away from torture towards mercy, right? I mean, she is the thing that turns him from this sort of blind life of pain and violence and stuff like that to a, a whole different way of looking at the world. I mean, she's the, not just because he falls in love with her, but also because he cares about her enough to violate everything he knows and to, to yeah, to, to turn to a different way of life, to a different moral attitude, or even get <laughs> what we might actually consider to be a moral attitude after this point. Um, so, yeah, I mean, even if, you know, I mean, I guess there are way, two ways you can see that. Like, to me, there's sort of the metaphorical sense that her name fits the claw because she's kind of like the thing that makes him become a better person. Then there's the more sort of direct thing in that she actually is some kind of embodiment of that that was intentionally put in his path or something that way. Um, I don't necessarily know about that, but but I think in terms of that more symbolic meaning, she absolutely is because she's what sets the whole story in motion. If it wasn't for her, there'd be no story, right? I mean, there, there would be no development of Severian towards whatever this conciliator path, the say the, you know, becoming the new son, none of that would happen because he'd have no reason to leave the guild and he'd have no reason to question what he knew and, and no reason to, you know, turn from torture to something else. So I, I buy it. Yeah. I totally buy it. And, and like you, I'm sort of amazed. I, you know, it totally makes sense. Um, but, but yeah, I don't, I, I had never noticed. It. Yeah. Well, I wonder now, whether all these little moments of reverie that Severian is so famous for, if that's Thecla. Yeah, and it, it could be. I mean, and the fact that she then stays with him, right? The fact that not only is she the person who puts him on this new path, but also that she really, the not just the memory of her, but she actually becomes a part of him from then on. It makes it more like a, you know, truly a change of self. I mean, literally a change of, of self, a change of being, you know, that, that she becomes part of him in a way that totally changes him. And there are places later where, um, 
Severian talks about how a lot of the best decisions he's made are really due to Thecla. He says that everything higher about him, everything that causes intellectuals to see him as their equal, he owes to the Thecla that he knew, the Thecla he remembers, and the Thecla that dwells inside of him. Yeah, and, and that works on a couple different levels because it means literally they could be recognizing her inside him, just like people occasionally think they see her or, or see her mannerisms in him. But it can also be that other thing of like, you know, she set me on the path to becoming something else. So it works perfectly. It works both literally and metaphorically at the same time um, for her to be that, yeah, that Holy Spirit, like you said. The, the... Right. I suppose that, you know, people who see Severian as a pawn of the hero Grimaldi's is probably uh, say, well, then Thecla must have been put in his path, but she could just as well be a happy accident that they didn't anticipate. And maybe that's what, I mean, that could actually be the thing that, I, I'm too many different theories running around, but if you if you buy the idea that there's so many that there are like cycles and cycles and cycles of Severians that have happened, and they all have slightly different you know sort of multiverse kinds of things, then the one that has Thecla in it could be she could be the thing that actually makes him be successful, that actually makes him be the one that that, that is capable of doing what he does. But it certainly works. I mean, I I think that once you make that connection. It, it actually clarifies a lot of things about her role in the story, I feel like. So I, yeah. I like it a lot. Excellent. Well, she, well, Thecla's in the last cell on the first level. It has a carpet, which is unusual, and a bed, chair, and small table, which is customary. But instead of being in rags, she's wearing a white gown with wide sleeves, cuffs on her sleeves, and the hem of her gown are pretty dirty. But she is still dressed nicer than anything Severian is familiar with. She'll tell us later that it's a gown to wear in the early afternoon, but before the evening. Mm -hmm. Apparently, she was arrested just before dinner. And this, by the way, is the first time I think it actually clicked that it's a white dress. For some reason, I always had pictured her in something green or, or you know, richly colored or something. But, but for some reason, picturing her in a white dress makes it seem very different to me, um, a different image. In my and it, once again, it reminds me of that body they dragged out of the mm -hmm. grave she had narrow very white teeth and a wide mouth maybe not the teeth she was born with her eyes are very deep and they shine when she smiles her hands are white and impossibly narrow that sort of reminds me of rudison's hands hmm. she's embroidering next to a candle the candle has a silver reflector it's a thing that props up next to the flame to brighten it he calls to her and she looks up. He sees, or maybe it's only later in reflection that he sees, that there is sheer terror in her eyes. But she controls it, he says, nearly to invisibility. And it is, I think, important that the first sort of, first sort of, I guess, verb <laughs> we actually get her doing is control. Um, that it, that she yeah. was controlling her fear um, or her terror at that point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He says he brought food. She's almost too tall to stand up in her cell. Her face is triangular instead of heart-shaped like her sister Thea. He didn't know yet that they were sisters, but she reminds him of the woman that he saw in the necropolis. And by the way, that distinction of, shape, of face shapes, I actually had to pull up some different pictures to really try to <laughs> figure out what the difference. It just seemed like it's such a subtle um, distinction in face type. So I would guess, I guess a heart-shaped face maybe has more rosier cheeks or something. I it was know. more about how the, the forehead is shaped and sort of how your, um, how your hair sort of frames the top of your head. So oh, okay. it's interesting if you, if you, if you were ever sort of confused about exactly maybe what a heart-shaped face would look like. Um, it's interesting to look up comparison uh, images of that online. It's a very subtle difference, yeah. but it does show to me the fact that I feel like that difference in the face is so subtle talks about how much Severian is paying attention <laughs> to, to women's faces. Well, yeah, I can see how the hairline would make a difference because he makes a, he does say something significant about her own hairline. Mm -hmm. He says that uh, perhaps it was her big violet eyes and the blue eye shade and the black hair that was parted in the middle that reminded him of Thea. He says that it forms a V down her forehead. Like the hood of a cloak, he says. Kind of like that point is coming up. Like the hood of a cloak. So, yeah. 
Exactly. So, I, I, yeah, I can th- see how that would be the difference, perhaps, between her and And Thea. I totally saw Raven from Teen Titans go as soon as he said that cloak. So I don't know <laughs> if there's any other any other Cartoon Network folk out there, but yeah, that, that popped up quickly. And this may be way too tiny, but the fact that he immediately thinks of Votalus, mentions Votalus, and then talks about a V down her forehead, that could mm-hmm. be, it, it's a bit of a stretch, but, you know, Severian is always looking for you know, for some kind of connection to Vodalus. So I don't know if there's much to make of that, but. Well, he is associated with that particular woman. So that would mm-hmm. remind him of Thea in the, in the necropolis, or it could mean more. Yeah. And he does say there too, he says, I loved her at once, loved her at least insofar as a stupid boy can love. And he says, but being only a stupid boy, I didn't know it. Um, I just like that little line there because it does call attention to sort of the difference between narrator Severian and story Severian at this point that you've got to remember what he's was going through then what he's looking, how he's describing it now looking back. And there's a third level that we haven't necessarily mentioned so far, but that there's not just Severian narrating this part, but there's also Thecla narrating it. Thecla herself. Severian yeah. is gonna, you know, that at this point, the Severian who's writing this story is also the Thecla that is now in his mind. Whenever I see little moments like that, you know, him reflecting on what it was like at that point, especially in this chapter, I always want to stop and think, okay, well, how much of that is Severian? How much that might be Thecla? How might their phrasing be a way that they're kind of playing with each other? You know, of him saying, you know, I loved you back then. I was just a stupid boy though. So I didn't really know you, but like I maybe know you now. I mean, it's, it, I, I don't know that you're necessarily supposed to pick up on that, but when you know what's going on, it makes reading those kind of moments. I feel like so much more fun to feel. I didn't stop to think of that because it was just so I, I could so relate to the idea of looking back on yourself many years mm-hmm. later as, a, you know, your, your stupid idiotic comments or your, the way you thought as a, as a kid and feeling some degree of contempt yeah. toward that person. Yeah. So she manages to touch his hand when she takes the tray through the slot. I think we're supposed to divine that this is intentional mm-hmm. and it works. Severian speaks to give her a tip. He says, that's ordinary food. I think you can get some that's better if you ask. So he's tipped her off, although he doesn't know it. He's betrayed an advantage. He's got an instant crush on her and he's broken the rules. And Thecla goes to work. She holds him there in the conversation. You're not wearing a mask. You're the first human face I've seen here. And he says, I'm only an apprentice. I won't be masked until next year. And she smiles. Now remember, all of this is apparently happening while he's peeking through the slot, right? So she smiles at him and, and it makes him feel warm and good. You know, the feeling. And he can barely pay attention to what she says. She says she's so happy to see his face and asks if he'll bring her meals to her all the time. When, what is this food? So now he's trapped in an extended conversation. No, it won't be me, only today, because Drota is occupied. He tries to remember what the food was. He really wants to, but he can't, and he can't see the tray. Which is weird, too, because we find out later it's the same thing he's going to eat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I, that caught me. I'm like, oh, is he? Is that supposed to be that he is so sort of flustered at this point that he can't even remember that he eats exactly the same thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. I, yeah, it's got to be. Except for mutton. Except for Mutton. Yeah. Anyway, so now she knows the name of the journeyman who's responsible for her. And he says, regardless of what the food is, it's best that she eats it. Oh, why I intend to eat it. People have always complimented me on my slender figure. But believe me, I eat like a dire wolf. She shows him the tray and makes him tell her what it is. And he refers to her as Chatelaine. And she says, Chatelaine, you needn't be so formal. You're my jailer. You can call me anything you want to choose. Her eyes are just dancing. She's improvising all this. So good. She says, call me Thecla. That's my name. Titles are for formal occasions. Names are for informal ones. And this one is that or nothing. I suppose it'll be very formal, though, when I receive my punishment. It usually is for exultants. She says she thinks... An exart will be at her punishment if he's allowed in. 
And if you wonder what an exarch looks like, she says he has scarlet patches. And it's an exarch too, by the way, is a, I mean, Wolf has said before that if there's one civilization he kind of had in the back of his mind, it was the Byzantine Empire. And an exarch was apparently originally something that was used as a, you know, an official. And it said it could have been a state official or even a religious official, but some kind of. Yeah, I, well, I, I guess it's kind of like a governor of some sort, but, you know, not an elected one, of course. Yeah, yeah, it could have. It was. Yeah. So it's it kind of went all the way up from from governor to um, a bishop. I think it was it's still a term I think used as a bishop in the Orthodox Church, I believe. So maybe just like a like a governor with religious mm-hmm. duties. Yeah. And then yeah. she mentions this particular guy, the Starost Egino. In Poland, it's a guy who administers a territory for the Mm. king. So again, it's a little bit like a governor, but maybe without the religious implications. So she asks, are you certain this is bread? And I think that's kind of funny. She pokes it and Severian worries that the bread might get her long white finger dirty. And Severian says, "Uh, you've eaten bread before, surely. And she says, not like this. (laughs) But she's not a complainer. She gnaws a bite and says, It isn't bad, though. You say they'll bring me better food if I ask for it? He says, I think so, Chatelaine. Thecla, she corrects him. She asks about the books that she wanted, and Severian says he has them. He runs back to Drott's table and gets them. He slides in the little green prayer book and the brown book, The Wonders of Earth and Sky, through the slot. The coffee table book that he supposed was a history of some royal family, and the other book don't go through the slot. As we said before, we know this other book to be the book of the new sun. But in Earth of the New Sun, it's implied that this is not our book of the new sun. But it is possible, even likely, that at this time, before anyone has asked Wolf to write Earth of the New Sun, that this could well be our book of the new sun, mm-hmm. right? So he's it's very... I was I was confused by this passage because Severian calls the book the unnamed book. He calls it the Green Book, but up to this point, he's called the Little Devotion Book the Green Book. Hmm. I don't guess this is solid enough to call another error in memory, but it is worth hmm. watching for. For now, the other book is green. Anyway, the two books won't fit through the slot. He says Drota will come later and open the door for her. And she says, oh, can't you do it? It's terrible to look through the slot and see them and not be able to touch them. And Severian says, look, I'm not even supposed to feed you. And she catches him. But you did. Besides, you brought them. Weren't you supposed to give them to me? He says, I could only argue weakly, knowing she was right in principle. The point of the rule against apprentices interacting with prisoners in the Ublet was to prevent escapes. And Severian figures she can't overpower him. And even if she could, she'd never get out. So Severian goes and he gets the keys. He unlocks the door. He opens it, closes it behind him. I guess it locks automatically. He stands there, unable to speak. The books go on her table beside the candle stand, her food pan, and the pitcher of water. And it's sort of it's just sort of funny to note too that uh, you know he didn't need to come inside. He could have handed him <laughs> to her, but that the way he describes it is just all of a sudden he was standing inside the room with the door locked. Um, and I just think that's kind of a neat way to to say you know sort of how much he's getting you know played a little bit right here. Yeah, he yeah, doesn't yeah. even describe walking into the room. He just all of a sudden the door shut behind him. So I think it's interesting how many things are sitting on that little table of yeah, a candle stand, mm-hmm. the food pan, the pitcher of water. It, it, I guess it's bigger than I imagine. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, you're right. He knows he should leave, but he can't. And Thecla says, won't you sit down? And I, look, I want to make a point here. People who say the women in Wolf's books are flat and uninteresting have really got to contend with this woman. She is so intelligent, so smooth. Severian is completely out of his depth. From the moment she saw his eyeball peeking through the door slot, she began deconstructing him and putting him back together. And this is not surprising. We're going to have explained that she's the autarch's hostage for some great house. She's supposed to be someone the autarch can lay hands on in case her family revolts. For propriety's sake, these female hostages are said to be nominally, anyway, concubines of the autarch. It gives them some standing in the royal house in this culture that seems fairly uh, patriarchal, at least the upper classes do. 
It means that they are not just girls out on their own hundreds of miles from their families. Whatever anyone does to them is done to the autarch's concubine. But if you're going to have someone assume that role, be a representative for your family in the supreme ruler's court, you're going to train her rigorously in the craft of diplomacy and manipulation and yeah. conversation. And I mean, we find out even more later about a lot of these people, but yeah, it, it sounds eventually like the, the concubine role, quote unquote concubine role is actually ends up being a really important political yeah. role. Um, so uh, the fact that, you know, not, not to forget the fact that they are still technically concubines, but you know, the, the people who, are sent, you know, the, the sisters or the, the wives or the daughters or whatever who are sent, it seemed like they obviously, at least in this case, have chosen specifically someone to go who was very yeah. capable. Valeria had pointed out that her family has so degenerated in importance in the Commonwealth that they don't have anyone mm -hmm. as a hostage because right. no one cares. But no, just to point that out, just to follow up on that. Yeah, Thecla is definitely, you know, Valeria, we don't really know much about we don't just, there's just mm -hmm. not enough to really learn much about her. But with Thecla from the beginning, um, you know, she's trying to, to figure out what power she can have in this situation and using it pretty clearly. Right. Exactly. And with every word she's grooming him. And even later, I mean, just to jump ahead, when Gerlos is talking to Severian, he seems to recognize something of that. I mean, he doesn't really know Thecla personally, but the one thing he sort of keeps telling Severian is just like, be careful, just be careful, just be careful. Even though Severian might know he's being manipulated, that doesn't necessarily give you the power to avoid being manipulated. Right. Just because you know that a, a logical fallacy exists doesn't protects you from falling into that logical fallacy mm -hmm. because that's the way your brain works. Yeah. And once again, just like Severian says, a thing works of itself or it doesn't. And if she is using techniques of manipulation that work, mm -hmm. they will work to some extent. So Severian uh, doesn't have a chance. He, he sits on her bed so that she can have the chair. And she says, if this were my suite in the house, absolute, I could offer you better comfort. Unfortunately, you never called while I was there. Naughty, naughty Severian. She offers them her leeks, but he refuses it. He's going to have supper in a bit, and she needs it. That's true. And she looks at him and kind of shrugs and drops a leek down her throat like a mountebank swallowing a viper. In this case, I suppose mountebank means a street performer, like a sword swallower or a magician. But I think it's deliberate that he uses a word that typically means a charlatan or a con man. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's actually a pretty complicated little comparison there because it's sort of him recognizing like maybe later, you know, how much she was playing him at that point. Um, I like the fact that, you know, she's then swallowing a viper, you know, I mean, it's like the, the person is so in control, they're, you know, swallowing the dangerous thing. Um, but it's so it's it's got an image of power, but it's also an image of deception. And also then, too, when it's a street performer, you know, a swindler or something like that, eventually it also is kind of a, a sign. It's someone who can play the role of power, but it's they're not the highest level <laughs> performer. It's not to say I don't think to say that Thecla isn't necessarily the best power here, but it's, it's just kind of a cool moment because she's still a prisoner. She's using what power she has, which let's be honest, is not a whole lot. And, you know, even though here, so it's just a really cool image. I think that kind of brings all those different, yeah, those different aspects of what's going on to play right here. Yeah. yeah. So she keeps the conversation going. What will his supper be? It'll be the same supper that she has, like you said, except it's going to include mutton. And then she asks, what's your name, master torturer? Anyone who has read The Hobbit knows the risk of giving out your name. <laughs> Severian has never read The Hobbit. Or Earthsea. Yeah, Earth yeah. Oh, don't give your exactly. real name. <laughs> he says, Severian, it won't help such, Chatelaine. It won't make any difference. And she smiles. Right. So, and this is the first, and that, that line too is the first time that you get a sense that even though Severian's being played, he's still. He knows he's being played. Aware because he knows he's like, look, it's. 
it's just not going to help. I know what you're doing, but it's, it, it won't be able to go very far. And it's kind of cool. So it's like, yeah, like you said, it's, it's a, they both know what's going on, but he's still wrapped up in it. I mean, it's really kind of a cool scene. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really complicated, but she just smiles and says, what won't work? And he, he says, making friends with me. I couldn't give you your freedom and I wouldn't, not if I had no friend, but you in all the world. And this statement by Severian, that mirrors something that she's going to say to him in her last moments. If I hate my last friend, what would be left? Yeah. So it's definitely, you know, recalling that moment and just a nice little parallel. Yeah. See, Severian thinks he's being cold and astute. He recognizes that Thecla is talking to him to manipulate him. Yeah. And that, that could be a way, like he's saying, he's all of a sudden trying to get his dignity back. Right. Like that's, that's kind of like, he's like, Oh no, 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 I'm strong. You know, but he's still talking to her. He's still playing, you know? Uh, Yeah. yeah. It's like, like, no, 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 no. Convince me, convince me. Yeah. Yeah. He assumes she's trying to trick him into helping her escape and no doubt, you know, she might welcome that later on if necessary, but thinking that's her only game just shows that he doesn't know what the game is that he's playing. So by getting him to talk to her, something that Drota would have known not to do. She's found out many things about her situation here. And Mm -hmm. she's not even done pumping this torturer's apprentice for what she needs, but she backs off. I I didn't think you could help me escape Severian. Notice that she's not only just learned his name and she's already using it. He says, well, then why bother talking to me? And she sighs and looks sad and says, "Ah, who else do I have to talk to? Severian uses his name again. It may be that I will talk to you for a time, for a few days or a few weeks and die. She turned the tables on him. He's the one with all the power. She's the helpless weak one here. And then she answers directly to his doubts. I know what you're thinking, that if I were back in my suite, I would never spare a glance for you. But you're wrong. One can't talk to everyone because there's so many everyones. But the day before I was taken, I talked for some time with the man who held my mount. I spoke to him because I had to wait, you see. And then he said something that interested me. To me, this sounds a little bit like saying some of my best friends are insignificant nobodies. But (laughs) but to be fair, she doesn't make the case quite that strongly. And Severian says, you won't see me again. Drota will bring your food. Well, that won't do. She has a fish firmly on the hook and she's not letting go. And not you? Ask him if he'll let you do it. She took my hands in hers and they were like ice. Is that because of the cell? Due to her exultant nature? Or a literary comment on her cold bloodedness at this point? (laughs) Yeah. Or fear. Or or really that she's still terrified. Yeah. He says, I'll try. Do, do try. Tell him I want better meals than this and for you to serve me. Wait, I'll ask him myself. To whom does he answer? He says, Master Gerloise. So in a place where nobody is allowed to talk to her, she's already got the names of three levels of authority. She says, I'll tell the other. Is it Drota that I want to speak to him? You're right. They'll have to do it. The Autark might release me. They don't know. In case it comes up, she affirms that the guild's difficult political position that she already knows Mm -hmm. about because they've already accommodated her. Her eyes flashed. Severian says that he'll tell Drota to ask her Louise, and he starts to leave. But Thecla, naturally, does not want the conversation to end. Wait, aren't you going to ask me why I'm here? And Severian, regaining some control of the situation, says as he closes the door, I know why you're here. To be tortured, eventually, like the others. A little old snap comment. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah. And he even says, you know, it was a cruel thing yeah, to say. Yeah. You know? But on reflection, he thinks that although it was cruel, it was good for her. He says, we had exultants for clients often before. Most, when they arrived, had some understanding of their situation, as Chatelaine Thecla did now. But when a few days had passed and they were not put to torment, their hope cast down their reason, and they began to talk of release, how friends and family would maneuver to gain their freedom, and what they would do when they were free, and one would withdraw to his estates and trouble the autarch's court no more. Another would volunteer to lead a muster of land squinettes in the north, 
than the journeymen on duty in the Obliette would hear tales of hunting dogs and remote heaths and, and country games, unknown elsewhere, played beneath immemorial trees. The women were more realistic, for the most part, but even they in time spoke of highly placed lovers, cast aside now for months or years, who would never abandon them, and then of bearing children or adopting waifs. One knew when these never-to-be-born children were given names that clothing would not be far behind, a new wardrobe on their release. The old clothes would be burned. They talked of colors, of inventing new fashions and reviving old ones. At last, the time would come to men and women alike when instead of a journeyman with food, Master Gerloise would appear, trailing three or four journeymen, and perhaps an examiner and a fulgurator. I wanted to preserve Chatelaine Thecla from such hopes, if I could. Now, I like this because it reminds me of something that John McCain once said. Uh, for any non-Americans listening, John McCain, who eventually became a U.S. senator, was the son of the U.S. commander of naval forces in Europe named John McCain Jr. He became a Navy pilot and was shot down over Vietnam in 1967. And although badly wounded, they refused him medical care and instead they tortured him for information so severely that he was never able to raise his arms over his head for the rest of his life. When they found out who his father was, they were anxious to cut a deal to have him released, but he refused to accept release until everyone else was released as well. He spent five years as a prisoner of war. My point is that someone asked him, was there any trait that helped a person survive in those conditions? He said that he only knew what would make you less likely to survive. Hope. He said a guy would come in and have these ideas of how he was going to be released by Christmas. Christmas was the day. If he only survived to Christmas, and then that arbitrary date would pass, and he would just wither away. Now, here's another question. Why were the women more realistic generally? I mean, honestly, it seems more like we've already mentioned how it does seem like patriarchal society. Um, and, you know, this is a place where women are being used as concubines for sort of political capital. Well, you know, it's, they already know that, you know, you know stories don't often end well. Yeah, um, and so I, I feel like that's one thing that it just seems to fit pretty well yeah, with, yeah. with the other situation, especially if they're talking mostly about, I mean, he talks about how there were, there were other aristocratic seeming women mm -hmm. and um, you know, and of course, Thecla here is being used as a pawn, right? Like, right. I mean, exactly. She's, she's just being used in a game. Yeah. She had, yeah, she hasn't done anything. She's, right. she's being tortured in Thea's yep. place. And um, one thing too, like your point about, you know, hope for someone in an awful situation can be terrible. I think that definitely fits. And it's also how, why Severian says he's explaining here why he feels like he was kind of being kind by telling her the harsh truth. At the same time, one other thing to notice here is all these sort of fun, very romantic, happy ending stories. Um, there are things that Severian is pointing out. This all happens when people are really at their worst. Yeah. And that whenever you have a wondrous story and a happy ending, that's only a story that gets told when, when people are refusing to face the worst thing. So just to sort of step all the way back. And if this is eventually kind of a story about saving the earth in the end, mm. it sort of makes you wonder, okay, well then when Severian does get caught up in that bigger story, which seems like it's going to be a salvation story in one way or another, is he, is that really the honest full story? of that or or is the happy ending you know is there really something much more complicated going on that just made me think about that because obviously what we have here is people telling fictions and stories about things and that when they're too happy it's probably because you're trying to hide something well one one good thing is i mean severian doesn't ever fall into the trap of sounding too positive <laughs> about the future or his place in it right yeah. Yep. And then a fulgurator, which I thought was interesting was, yeah, it's someone who can read the future. So I thought that was kind of interesting that right here already, you're kind of getting this little thing about not time travel, but about looking mm -hmm. through time and, and getting things, even if you don't really notice it, but, but 
Well, is, is, is that the, like the equivalent of a priest then? Um, I think it's my sense when when I looked it up was that it's not necessarily like it. I think it was meant to sound like some kind of. Oh, wait. Oh, here it is. Oh, sorry. I'm looking things up. Actually, one of the possible definitions is that it's a priest who interprets omens from lightning is one of the words from it. But it's someone who can tell the future by looking at lightning, by basically reading lightning. Huh. Well, I wonder what his job is there. Is he supposed to be determining what, whether the victim is telling the truth or not? Or In Lexicon Earthus, he says that uh, at, at the Citadel, it's a priest or technician commonly employed by the torturers whenever the electrical devices are to be used. But yeah, no, definitely a kind of, I think, a, a priest figure. So that's a lot. So we should stop and remember here, too, that the title of the chapter is The Traitorous. But it's a problem because we find out that you know, Thecla isn't the one who possibly has actually done something. When Gerlouise tells him, it sort of explains the situation. He says it's because her sister was Thea, who was with Bodilus. Mm-hmm. And Thecla is just being used at this place. So the, the traitress would, we think, right, yeah. be Thea um, rather than Thecla. So that's another point where the chapter title makes you think Thecla is going to be the traitress. But at least at this point in the story, it's not her at all. Yeah. It's Thea. Well, I, I I think that maybe she's as at least almost as guilty as as Thea. But it, it, it doesn't mean anybody knows it. it. Doesn't mean that it's fair. And you mean in terms of being connected to Vodalist? Yeah, yeah. Or if not Vodalist directly, then other people who mm-hmm. would also people, other things that support Vodalus. Yeah. So, yeah. So like a, a communist sympathizer would be called a pinko. What would you call right. someone who's a, a sympathizer for Erebus and Avia? Like they're damp or something. I don't know. But... <laughs> wet ones. <laughs> the wet ones. So on his way out, Drota is mopping blood off the floor. Remember, he Drota is like 19 or 20 years old. <laughs> and Severian mm-hmm. yep. tells him, Thecla wants to talk to him. So two days later, Master Gurlios calls him into his office. Typically, when apprentices come into the office, they stand at attention with their hands behind them. This time, Gurlois tells him to sit. He takes off his mask. I don't think we appreciate the degree to which torturers apparently constantly wear their masks Mm -hmm. on the job, even in private, even when it is only other torturers. And Gerloise's demeanor is one of a degree of equality. He says, Severian says, a common cause and friendly footing. And he says, a week ago, or a little less, I sent you to the archivist. And that's not technically accurate, but it's only like a few days ago, like a couple days ago, but, you know, Severian doesn't dispute it. Gerloise has understood that Severian delivered the books himself. And Severian says he explained what had happened. But I think that only means that he explained how it happened that he personally delivered the books. Right. Gurlois says, nothing wrong there. I don't want you to think I'm going to order extra fatigues for what you did, much less have you bent over a chair. I think it's interesting that he gives the details of what he's not going to do. (laughs) So (laughs) he says, you're nearly a journeyman yourself already. When I was your age, they had me cranking the alternator. That's something only a journeyman does. And Gerlois begins to explain the political nature of having a well-placed exultant from a powerful family in custody, especially when the said exultant is not personally accused of wrongdoing. He explains that there are exultants and then there are exultants. He says there are lots of exultant families. Huge numbers of families have been, that have been extinguished. He says, I have extinguished a few of them myself. That's torturous humor. And they both laugh. (laughs) But the thing is that most of the exultant families don't have a representative at the court of the autarch. He says, can't afford it or are afraid of it. Unless there's a real advantage to be had in involving yourself in court politics, it's just too dangerous. Extinguish families and such, you know. But the big powerful families don't have a choice at the very least, they have to provide a concubine, as we explained earlier. Valeria and the Atrium Time didn't have one, and that's a sign of shame, a loss of prestige. But even the ones that provide hostages, concubines, the autarch doesn't deal with them all. We get an interesting term here from Gerlois. He doesn't 
play quadrille. A quadrille is a square dance. Mm-hmm. Any dance where people regularly exchange partners. That's an excellent metaphorical use. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Especially once you get the exchanging partner. But yeah. It was also a there was a card game, which which because when when he said play quadrille, that's where I was like, that's a, the dance. But I mean, I know obviously you know what they mean, but right. But yeah. So anyway, uh, Gurlois figures the Autark takes maybe 20 as actual close concubines. The others, he gives a number of 500, just partake in endless real lives of the Autark's reality TV episodes. They talk, <laughs> they have parties, on and on. They don't get closer than a chain from the Autark in a month. A chain is 20 meters, 33 yards. Now, Severian is a boy with a major crush on Thecla. So trying to hold his voice steady, unquote, he asks if the Autark really gets physically intimate with these women. And Gerloise explains the custom of kaibits. Now, a, is that right? Kaibit? Mm. I, that's how I say it. That's how I All think. Right. Or it's how I say it in my head. <laughs> now, a kaibit is an ancient Egyptian term for a person's shadow. And the shadow was perceived as containing part of the person. It was a kind of soul. Egyptian philosophy had a fairly complicated deconstruction of the soul. They had defied nine or more different types of souls. Gerloise translates, however, and calls these kaibits shadow women, commoners, that look like the concubine or hostages. He says, I don't know where they get them, but they're supposed to stand in the place of the others. Of course, they're not so tall. Har, har, har. He says, I said stand in place, but when they're laying down, tallness probably doesn't make much difference. He inputs some dubious lore that might have significance later on, according to many earth theorists. He says, they do say, though, that oftentimes it works the other way than it's supposed to. Instead of those shadow girls doing duty for their mistresses, the mistresses sneak in and do it for them. And so that point right there does, I think it goes back to that point we were talking earlier about how these concubines are often smooth political actors. And that's one way that you could think of them, you know, taking control of a bad situation where, you know, they're sent there, they're trapped. For decency's sake, they let the the kibitz go in and do the dirty work for them. But if you're really trying to be savvy, then if you have that much access to the the dude with the power, yeah. and if you can get him to really like you, then you know. So it becomes this really complicated game of you know balancing threats and decency with you know insecurities and with getting close to people and and yeah just just gets really complicated really really fast if you're familiar with english royal history you know how dangerous it is just to be close to a di- essentially a dictator mm-hmm. uh, people would fall out of favor they would make mistakes and find themselves accused of crimes and beheaded yeah. sometimes it would only take a, a matter of weeks to be a, in a position of favorability to suddenly being on, on a list. One other thing too, the kibitz, I was trying to remember if that word is used later on in the book in connection with clones. Um, Andre Drusi says that they could be clones when you, in the definition for kibitz, but he's just referring to this. And I was, do you remember if they use the term elsewhere for a clone? Well, In Citadel of the Autark, the Autark says of the Kaibits that they are, quote, grown from the body cells of exultant women, so an exchange of blood will prolong the exultant's youth. I didn't know this was a known thing before the last couple of decades. And I didn't know that at all. Oh, yeah. They've done experiments where they provide blood transfusions from younger donors to older recipients. And supposedly it provides some sorts of longevity benefits. I mean, even in the HBO series, Silicon Valley, they had a little side plot where a billionaire had a hired blood donor, a y- young kid, and he you know, monitored everything he ate and put into his body. You know, He would provide blood transfusions to him on a regular basis in order to keep him young. So apparently, you know, Wolf must have sensed this was a possibility if it wasn't theorized in some places. And the purpose of these kibits, you know, at least originally, 
was that they would always be around to provide blood transfusions to their originals. And, you know, yeah, that, that's kind of creepy all by itself. A little bit of... A little bit of real vampirism there, but but yeah. So the fact that they are, if, if not direct clones, I guess they're they're close clones, which makes it weird because I mean, Severian obviously recognizes who their kybits are supposed to be copies of, and you know is, but it's also different enough that he feels cheated, like that he feels. Well, you know, he could tell the difference, just as you could tell the difference between two twins if you're familiar with them. But I get the sense it's even more than twins, like like more different than twins, right? Like it's obvious. Like he talks about how they're shorter, right? That they're not they're not nearly mm-hmm. as tall as yeah. the regular ones. So, so yeah. So that's the only thing that I I don't know if I'm I'm wondering too much about the mechanics of it. But yeah. So so something that's cloned but not quite cloned. Um, um, well, doesn't it imply that the exultant's physical features, their height and such is not genetic. Maybe it's just a treatment they received from their youth. That That's actually something I hadn't thought. I had always assumed that the height thing was almost kind of the opposite, was to say that, oh, they're actually, it's all hereditary. And that it's kind of, you know, Earth has gone backwards so that we're in some kind of hereditary aristocracy or something like that. But at, but, but that's a different idea that I hadn't thought of. That, hmm. There's always been an implication that Severian is at least half exultant or has exultant blood in him. Little hints here and there. Right. Mm-hmm. If you assume that the maid at the Feast of Holy Catherine is Severian's mother, that becomes problematic because she is not obviously tall. But, you know, she might be very young, only be the height of, an, of a right. normal adult woman. Or she might have not undergone the treatments yet. Sure. And I mean, we know what Baldanders is doing, right? I mean, he's making himself bigger and that that's not just status, but has to do with power somehow. Yeah. I mean, that actually opens up a whole lot of possibilities that I hadn't thought of, that the exultants are more, are taller because there's some other procedure that they're doing or set of procedures and and maybe it could be also genetically inherited, but then maybe Baldanders is like an extreme version of what they're doing. Um, that could be, it also, maybe not, hmm, I'm trying to think, cause I know with Wolf's fascination with Lamarckian evolution, which is more evolution in the purposeful evolution, um, or, or where traits are inherited, you know, even environmental traits can be inherited. That's where I wonder if there's more, maybe if not actual procedures, maybe that, that, you know, exultant children have to go through or something, but rather, I don't know if it's, it's connected to, I, I'm sorry, I'm sort of brainstorming here with different ideas about how that might work but no that does make that does open up a whole lot of different questions about why the exultants are taller Um, because i had just always kind of assumed it was hereditary and probably due to living either having i don't know if i'd call it completely alien dna but also perhaps at one point having lived off world and having come back to earth Um, not the actual individual people but the families being extra literally extra extraterrestrial um, but if it's something else going on and the kybits are proof of how it's going differently, hmm, interesting. I don't know, I don't know where to go with it, but that's definitely possible. Especially once we know that the kybits are cloned, but yeah, not well, identical. I, I, it so. probably surprised you to learn that I haven't really thought much about this. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know, I'm totally brainstorming out loud too. But yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it just. It sounds like just the rabbit hole I would have already been down and bought all the t-shirts for. So, <laughs> well, you know, but I haven't. So if anyone has, you know, any input into this, I'd really like to hear what you have to say. Mm-hmm, definitely. But then uh, Girl Louise reveals that he is aware of what we know, that the current androgynous Autark is unlikely to square dance with any of them. <laughs> It, because the heroes have castrated him. Yeah. And at this Severian, young, smitten boy that he is, says, relief flooded my heart. I never knew that. It's very interesting, Master. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, can we talk about this test to become the new son? At the end of this story, Severian is going to meet the equaster Master Malrubius, uh, Maybe, maybe not the same. Mar- right. By the way, 
we didn't just make a vast leap or, or make an edit. So just just so you know that one of the the things we find out is that when when an autark fails the test for the new sun, they say that one of the things that happens is they unman them or they cast them. Exactly. And exactly. so that's that's where the that's where that happens. Yeah. So sorry. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, so at the end of the story, Severian meets the Equaster, uh, Master Malrubius. Maybe mm. maybe not the same Malrubius Severian saw while he was drowning in the guile. And Malrubius explains that if Severian takes the test and fails, he will be castrated. So he can't produce an heir. I don't get this because no autark has to take the test. He or she, I mean, there've been child autarchs we find out, but the, the autark has to agree to it. Most autarchs don't even try. Incidentally, surely this is why the autark Emar is known as the almost just because he attempted and failed. So why is it that if an autark freely opts to take the test, he needs to be castrated? It's entirely possible that the failed autark has already sired children. Severian himself will not live as a monk. So, you know, what am I misunderstanding here? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the thing I always assumed was that you, they castrate him so that that failed person can't, you know, can't beget other failed <laughs> <laughs> autarchs that come through. Um, but yeah, the, the point being about like, could, but wouldn't they have already possibly have you know, yeah. had a bunch of kids? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. And we don't, we never really learn a whole lot about how succession happens. It's always sort of this odd behind the scenes choosing, right? Like there's never. Yeah. So variant happens almost by, chance right yeah yeah but there's never the idea i don't think that there are heirs like the autark has an heir right who who comes up but the big one is only the failed ones only only the ones who choose to take the test does it matter if they choose to take the test and they fail then they have to be castrated mm. yeah i don't know oh, I, I think that one's more it, it seems more like the more like the projecting the image of we're just going to make sure that, you know, your <laughs> failed version isn't going to get another shot. Yeah. Um, and right. so we have to look elsewhere, but yeah. it's a good question. Like what are the actual sort of mechanical reasons behind it? Yeah. I don't know. Well, so girl Louise goes on as if he's been reading Severian's mind, he says, you'll need to know these things when I was your age or a trifle younger, I suppose I used to fancy that I was of exalted blood. Some have been, you know, Severian says, it struck me then, and not for the first time, that Master Gerlois and Master Palamon, too, must have known whence all the apprentices and younger journeymen have come, having approved their admission originally. This is an ominous aside. Do Palamon and Gerlois have a reason to favor Severian as having potential for great advancement in the guild? Is this why they'll go so lightly on him after his betrayal? It could be. And that was, I hadn't thought of that before, but the fact that Wolf puts those two ideas really, you know, close there, um, mm -hmm. th that makes sense now. So Gerlois goes on. Whether I'm an exultant or no, I cannot say. I have the physique of a writer, I think, and I am somewhat over the average in height, despite a hard boyhood, for it was harder, much harder 40 years ago, I'll tell you. That's an interesting unrelated past there and yeah. and this is an interesting description he wheezed the kind of wheezing noise a leather pillow sometimes make when one sits on it girlies is a half glass full kind of guy he says but with the passage of time i've come to understand that the increate in choosing me for a career in our guild was acting for my benefit doubtless i had acquired merit in a previous light as I hope I have in this one. In all my years, I have never known a member of the guild put to torment. Of them, several hundred, I suppose, several hundred torturers. So as big and fancy as the exultants are, they might well end up in the oubliette, while the mm -hmm. torturers never will. Yeah. Gurlios says that in that way, the torturers are better. And just to go back, he does throw in that little thing there about, doubtless I acquired merit in a previous life just one it's a throwaway line and you know i i don't assume that that means that everybody thinks that they 
actually, you know, we're that reincarnation is a common idea. Um, but it is kind of the, the whole idea of acquiring merit in a previous life. I mean, we've got, we certainly know that there are Hindu stories that get told. Yeah. Ajia tells, tells Severian, uh, a, a common Hindu story, but yeah, he throws that out there and it's just a, a kind of theological idea that doesn't really show up. Yeah. Um, you don't really know what people think happens after their death. Mm-hmm. I, but I, although it's, it sounds like it's, it's commonly believed that, that in reincarnation possibly. So mm-hmm. now girl Louise gets to the point. Although I've seen 500 or more exultants in our cells, I have never until now had charge of a member of that inner circle of concubines closest to the autark. He says it wouldn't be a problem if they were to put Thecla to torture and execution immediately. It's this waiting period that's tricky. If she gets released, she'll be in a position to exact retribution on the guild and individual torturers. So she was sent to the guild, as we know, because her sister Thea, resident of the autark's court, has joined Vodalus as his girlfriend, and Gerloise uses the term Lehman. Mm. The idea is to convince Thea to give herself up, but later Thecla is, will tell Severian she knows that will never work, either because she knows that Thea's heart is too steely or the relationship wasn't that great. So during this time, they have to treat her well, but not too well. Severian, incidentally, also sees himself in a spot here, not knowing how much Thecla told Drota, and what Drota had told Gerloise, he's wondering whether Gerloise is hinting that Severian has already treated her too well. But Gerloise has something else in mind. She's asked for better food and company. She'll get the food, but she was told that visitors aren't permitted. So she's asked that one of the guild be her company because she'd already seen Severian's face, Gerloise supposes. She's asked for him. Aha, he doesn't know Severian went in and talked to her. That's the story, at least as Girl Louise understands it. So should we read that there's anything actually about Severian's face that appealed to her, even subconsciously? I like the idea because it it works with a lot of the other things that sort of make Severian seem chosen or, or things like mm-hmm. that. But honestly, though, I feel like what's there is just that he was the one unmasked face that she saw. Yeah. Severian is supposed to sit with her during meals. Gerlois treats this as an imposition, but he says that Severian has to be careful not to displease her and not to please her too much. Those are tricky instructions for anyone, let alone an 18-year-old. I think this is a sign that Gerlois seems to have a high regard for Severian. Gerlois deals with what he anticipates will be a problem with this new job, and he deals with it in a way, to his way of thinking, is the best way. He says, have you been with a woman? Despite all detected similarities between tortures and Catholic priests, they don't seem to marry, for instance. There's no requirement that they be chaste, but Severian does not lie. He says no. It would be hard, I think, for an apprentice torturer, penniless, having negative social cred to get himself a girlfriend. Apparently, it is not uncommon for the apprentices to go to the witch's keep to socialize. Why do you suppose Gerlois says that it's best that Severian never lost his virginity to the witches? He says, that may be for the best. They supplied my own instruction in the warm commerce, but I'm not sure I'd send them another such as I was. Is that a negative comment on the witches or Gerlois? Yeah, I know. That's what I was wondering this time. Like, it made me think, what... I mean, we know so little about the witches anyway. Um, right. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I when I, I have to admit, this time it seems more like a comment on the witches because he's still going to send Severian somewhere. Um, mm. So it does seem like that. But I have no idea what actually went on with poor young little Girl Louise. <laughs> <laughs> but Girl Louise specifically instructs Severian that he is not to have sex with this particular client if she asks. He says her pregnancy would be no ordinary one. It might force a delay in her torment and bring disgrace on the guild. You follow me? Maybe the implication here is that extracurricular sex with clients is not unheard of Mm -hmm. and can be dealt with. He says, boys, your age are troubled. I'll have somebody take you where such ills are speedily cured. 
So Varian says, as you wish, master. And Girl Louise replies, what? You don't thank me? Thank you, master. <laughs> and then finally, we get some personal descriptions of Girl Louise, something I don't think we ever get about Palamon. Palamon no. And I have to say this last little section is odd, but it's one of my favorite little vignettes of mm -hmm. the whole book, just because he spends so much time a little bit randomly, like explaining Gurley's personality and the sort of contradictions in him and, you know, implied tragedy of, of whatnot. And I just, I like it because it seems out of place, you know, it's because it's not something that Severian ever really does for any other character of just like stop completely outside of the story and describe a personality, but it really works because here we're still trying to learn about the guild, we're trying to learn about, okay, what does it actually mean to be a torturer? I mean, these are terrifying, awful people on the one hand, but then we're also in a situation where they're being humanized and professionalized and whatnot. And I feel like what it does, though, is even though it's it, it doesn't feel seamless at all, like it just feels like it stands out to me like an odd thing for a storyteller to do. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly not something Wolf does in other places that I can think of. Yeah, But it does, it goes a long way to presenting how complicated it is to be a torture. And I like that because it doesn't, it doesn't really humanize the tortures. I mean, in fact, it makes it, he's sort of in a lot of ways talking about how Gerlois was trying to make himself a monster and not doing so good a job at it. <laughs> you know, so it's, I don't know. I just, I think it's really a cool passage that it goes a long way to really helping think about what it would be like to be a torturer and to be a really reflective person. Well, he, here's why I think this is important. I think Severian is setting us up for what's going to happen at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He says that girl Louise was one of the most complex men I've ever known because he was a complex man trying to be simple, not, really simple, but a complex man's idea of simplicity. I love that. That's one of my favorite, yeah. like yeah. his favorite couple of lines in the whole book. Yeah. yeah. He, he gives this analogy. Just as a courtier forms himself into something brilliant and involved midway between a dancing master and a diplomacist with a touch of assassin if needed. So master Gerlois had shaped himself to be the dull creature that a pursuivant or bailiff expected to see when he summoned the head of our guild. And in reality, that is the only thing a real torturer cannot be. The strain showed through every part of Gerlois was as it should have been. None of the parts fit. That's really a good description. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And then he goes on to do everything in that he describes is all the sort of odd ways that he can't even suffer in a normal way. <laughs> like right. he can't even feel guilty in a straightforward right. way. Yeah. Yeah. He says he drank heavily and suffered from nightmares, but he especially had nightmares after he'd been drinking. He'd wake up early in the morning, staggering about trying to catch a glimpse of a sun that had not yet appeared, a sun that would banish the phantoms from his big cabin. Notice the cabin reference. Mm -hmm. And now this is interesting. Sometimes he went to the top of our tower above the guns and waited there talking to himself, peering through glass said to be harder than Flint for the first beams. He was the only one in our guild, Palamon not accepted, who was unafraid of the energies there and the unseen mouths that spoke sometimes to human beings and sometimes to other mouths in other towers and keeps. So by the time he writes this, Severian must be aware of radio, but he's putting himself back in the mind at the time. The point of that is that Gurlaris would get up when he couldn't sleep and talk over the wireless radio yeah. devices or listen to him. He's a CB guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> breaker, breaker. So this is perhaps why it is that he talks about politics of their situation rather than mm -hmm. Palamon. And, th and then he goes on, he says that Girl Louise loved music, but he thumped the arm of his chair to it and tapped his foot and did so most vigorously to the kind that he liked best, whose rhythms were too subtle for any regular cadence. He ate too much and too seldom, a binge eater. He read when he thought no one knew of it 
and visited certain of our clients, including one on the third level, to talk of things none of us eavesdropping in the corridor outside could understand. Remember, the third level is mostly occupied by clients who've lost their minds. Mm. His eyes were refulgent, brighter than any woman's. He mispronounced quite common words like urticate, salpinx, bordero. <laughs> so of course those are, I mean, that's a joke, of course, you know, but, um, but yeah, but if you look up what they mean, urticate means like to stain or to paint to like to yeah. something. A salpinx is a trumpet of some kind. Well, like, like you would hold up a, uh, like a, a, a torch or something in the wall that you go by and put a torch in the wall. Or something. Oh, is or, that, what, what, I thought it was like a musical instrument. Let me check. Let me check. No, it's, 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 it means trumpet shaped. Oh, oh, so, oh, 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 okay. Gotcha. 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 So it could, it could refer to um, things in biology and in bio and uh, botany. Yeah. Okay. Also things that he might not be aware of. Gotcha. So that actually, Trumpet shaped. Well, see, then thinking, because I mean, part of the thing is that all three of these words are things that would be common to the torturers right. um, and, you know, the the pain. So when you think of a trumpet, like shaped, then it's some kind of awful instrument. Like, yeah, that's just awful. <laughs> okay. Um, and then bordero, which is more like a, a schedule. It's a bureaucratic thing. Yeah. Um, like uh, a document of, of, of documents. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he describes how his, his whole desk is covered in papers and things like that. So, yeah. um, but yeah, it's a funny joke, but then he also makes each one of them work really yeah. well for that, for that right. world. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, this, that's environmental color delivered yeah. in the most perfect way imagined. Yeah. So he sums it all up with this. I cannot tell you how bad he looked when I returned to the Citadel recently, how bad he looks now. Like, as we discussed in the last chapter, at the end of Citadel of the Autark, Severian, as Autark, returns to the Citadel and stays at the Great Keep and talks to characters we've met along the way. He mm -hmm. talks to Palamon, but we don't get to see Gerlouise. But Severian ends the practice of torture for the guild, opting for execution only when necessary. This essentially eliminates the guild, So since so much of what they did and perfected was no longer necessary. Right. And his reason for this was, quote, by our mercy, we will grant even the foulest a quick death, not because we pity them, but because it is intolerable that good men should spend a lifetime dispensing pain. Now we know that, that Gerlouise was the expert in dispensing details of torture. He's the one that ordered Thea's maid to be given a full boot instead of a half right. boot because she'd been employed in housework and he found them to be tough skinned. He was the one who put Thecla to the revolutionary device. At times rape was one of the tortures ordered to be administered by to clients. Yeah. So it's hard to believe that when Severian refers to good men spending a lifetime dispensing pain, he's not thinking of girl. Yes. Yeah. And it may just be worth mentioning a little bit here now that that point about the reason why Severian in the end gets rid of the guild or changes the guild, uh, it doesn't necessarily have a sort of ethical motivation that I think is more modern. <laughs> I think, you know, because I mean, well, honestly, what I mean is normally we would think, okay, we would get rid of torture because we don't want to make the imprisoned suffer. But so the reasoning for it, that the real problem with torture is that what it does is it makes a good man, the person who would be doing the torture, otherwise evil. You know, Severian doesn't have a high opinion of the prisoners that are give, handed over to his care. No. Oh, yeah. He even said in the last chapter about how, you know, there are human beings who are just dirt. <laughs> you know, I mean, he mentions that. Yeah. Well, yeah, he says, I think it's in the second chapter, he says that they are usually less valuable and less innocent than cattle. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a sentiment that is not, it's not Christian. <laughs> it's, it, this is a different world. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Yeah. That's a, that's a, a good point too. But I, I also, that's a good way to think about it. Like, how does that, how do we marry that with a lot of the other things that are going on? What is, what makes Severian so good? You know, like, why is he the one who's right. chosen? Because I think, a, I know I read that part and I had a moment where I thought for a second, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a really good point about how it is. But isn't the more obvious point that you just shouldn't torture people? You know, but that's not Severian's, <laughs> you know, it's, that's not his thinking. And I think that's yeah. actually really important to get at 
a lot of the things that Wolf is going on here. Whether you agree or not, in the end, it's yeah. important not to make too quick a judgment over good and bad. Yeah. Well, Wolf is someone who was someone who was open to a heterodox mm -hmm. point of view on, oh, yeah. on many oh, yeah. things. When Severian says that he's going to stop torturing people for the sake of the torturers, Palamon gives a lot of very good reasons and rationales for why he has to mm -hmm. do this, why the guild is necessary for this society. He says, what are you going to do? You're going to keep them in prisons and then you're just going to have an army yeah. <laughs> ready to go out against you at any given yeah. time. Elsewhere, uh, Wolf has given a defense of the ancient practice of slavery, of taking people in war and making them mm -hmm. slaves, and given that the alternative he says, would have been mass slaughter. Yeah. Well, it is time for some odd theories. Curiositas Urthus. Well, I've got one for this one. Uh, it's one that I think on the surface just obviously doesn't work for some pretty straightforward reasons, but I still thought it was fun. So this is from Reddit from a long time ago. But the basic theory is this, that the woman that Drada is saving is actually Thecla, the real Thecla, and that the Thecla who Severian interacts with is either a clone or a, I don't think it's supposed to, well, see, this is where I got confused on the reading. I think he said it it should be a clone because it has to be someone who looks like the other, uh, looks like Thea and looks like the the concubine that he sees that he meets in the next chapter in the house in the uh, house azure but the whole point behind this was that what we've got is really how deeply complicated Vodalus's conspiracy goes that he was able to get people to exchange thecla and another woman somehow and then somehow get rid of thecla um and then eventually that the thecla that Severian eats <laughs> is um, <laughs> the wrong Thecla. And that, that what's really going on is this sort of deep, deep, deep level conspiracy as a way to sort of complicate or to really subvert the sort of Hyradul's plan for Severian. Um, I thought that was pretty ingenious. Uh, and he actually does have some other points about other chapters about how that works out. But as soon as you actually get the memories, that's the thing that makes that that fall apart for me that as soon as you get all of that person's memories, wouldn't it fail? And that's, I think why it had to be a clone was because then he would do that, but then how they train the clone to be different. I don't know. So I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't work, but, but if the clone has all the memories, then how has they been? Yeah, I don't know. But, but what I did like was the, the idea that, you know, we see this woman who's dying and we don't know much if, if anything about her, um, who's tried to kill herself. Thecla eventually is going to kill herself. And, you know, it, it just, it made some sense that why are we shown this person? Um, I mean, I think obviously the, the whole reason for that happening is so that Severian has to be the one to go give her the food and the books and start the whole right. story going. But, but nonetheless, I thought that was pretty ingenious way to start thinking about what would it mean if that was actually Thecla and the Thecla that we know is someone separate. I thought it was unique enough. I hadn't heard, I hadn't, I hadn't gotten that that type of theory before. So that Thecla has always been part of a deeper, deeper conspiracy than we knew to actually infect Severian from the inside out. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's that pretty is good. deep. I'm really proud. Well, good. Well, that's a lot. We, we have a lot here, but Thecla, I think, is a character who really um, pays off. And we're going to get more about her. So next time we will get on to the House Azure, or at least on the way to the House Azure. So like we always say, if you do want to get in touch with us, want to talk about anything we've we've mentioned, have corrections or have theories, please get in touch with us on social media. The Facebook group, just search for Rereading Wolf Podcast. You can find us on Reddit. We have a Twitter account. We even have an Instagram account yeah. where James has been really doing a great job of finding some covers, still a few I haven't seen before that he's sharing on there. So trying to do the whole social media thing. So feel free to, <laughs> to jump on and, and find us in any way, but it's just fun to talk about. And if you don't feel like talking in front of everybody else, you can always just send us an email at rereadingwolf at gmail.com. 
and we will both read them and get back to you as quickly as we can and talk about it here on the show. And just as a point of pride, we would really appreciate any reviews on Apple Podcasts, what iTunes turned into. We're actually, we haven't done it yet, but we're working maybe on a little small thank you we could give out to people who do that. Um, I won't spoil it yet because it's not finished, <laughs> but, but maybe something. Yeah. You know what? If you go ahead and, and write a review, we won't hold it against you. We're not going to say, well, you know, the, the, the promotion wasn't going on. So. <laughs> Absolutely. But that's just more for, for the fun of us. So we were joking about how people in the podcast world say that, that the way that your podcast shows up higher in the search lists is by the number of reviews are they're out there. There are only three Gene Wolf podcasts that I know of at the moment. So I'm pretty sure all three would show up on the screen. Yeah, but if we get the most reviews, then I can start referring to those other ones as nice little niche podcasts. <laughs> We'd appreciate that, too. The main thing, though, is we really like the discussion that goes on in between the episodes. And James and I both try to check things every day as often as we can, especially on Facebook, because it's just kind of habit at this point. And we'd love to hear more. And want to say thanks again to everyone who has been participating all this time. Uh, there's there's a, a wonderful, friendly group of familiar faces, familiar names that we're starting to see. Friends from old and friends that are new. Anything else? I don't think anything. I think okay. we've got it all, man. All right. So good. So until next time, thanks for listening and take care, everybody. Thank you. But no one can spy into my little room. Just like a flood that needs the sunlight So once again our love could bloom I hope and I pray That maybe someday you're with me to stay Here in my little room You're with me to stay Here in my little room Here in my little Although I would avoid probably telling people who haven't read the book yet, because I don't know that it's the best sell to say, you should read this book and then listen to this hour long podcast about each chapter that goes along with it. it might not be the best sell. In the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't tell them that they'll have to listen to this podcast. <laughs>